Good afternoon. Uh, I want to welcome you all to our session. I'm Marna Weston and we are in Pensacola, Florida at the Pensacola Public Library at the <laughs> Samuel Proctor Oral History Program. And we're doing our Gulf Soft interviews. We've stopped in Pensacola tonight. It is July 11th, 2023. It is my honor to be here this evening with Mr. Earl Jones Sr., Mr. Herman Haffler, and Ms. Angelique Morris. I'd like to thank you and welcome you all to our interview. Yeah, I'll, I'll hold it for you unless you go pass it between Thank each you. other. Pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'd like to speak to each of you in turn uh, at the beginning, just to talk to you a little bit about your family life, who you are, um, when you were born, who your parents are, just to kind of get that information down. So we can start with um, you, Mr. Jones. Can you tell us, um, your, please say your name and say when you were born. I'm Earl L. Jones Sr. And uh, my name and my Date of birth is eleven twenty seven forty seven. Actually, born on Thanksgiving Day. Oh wow! And uh, been pretty much a Pensacola native since, except for eleven years I was away in college and working. But I've been back for forty nine years already. Okay. And uh, who are your mom and dad? Uh, Ernest L. Jones was my father, and Daisy P. Jones was my mother. Mm -hmm. And do you know uh, how they met? Uh, not exactly. Uh, not exactly how they met. I don't know how they met, but okay. uh, they. My my mother was born and raised in Pensacola. Okay. My father was from Lower Alabama, uh, in Conecuh County, Alabama, mm -hmm. and he came here when he was about 17 years old. Okay. And. Uh, Do you remember your grandparents? I remember both sets. My okay. father's grandparent. My father's father was uh, Charlie Red Jones, and his and her his mother was El. Roberta Jones. Mm -hmm. My mother's father was uh, Henry Henry Pittman, and my mother and my mother's mother was uh, Evelina Pittman, mm -hmm. and my grandfather uh, Ern, uh, Henry Pittman came here from Mariana, Florida. Okay. Do you, uh, most people only know about the grandparents, but do you know any about your family past your grandparents? Who their parents might have been? He, uh, somewhat. Um, I, as I said, my grandfather, Henry Pittman, came to Pensacola with one wife. Uh, she had one child and died. Her name was Daisy. He went back to Marianne and got uh, the second wife, which was, uh, I can't remember, <laughs> it didn't make break. They went back and got the second wife. She had one child and died. Mm -hmm. He went back and got the third wife, Evelina, my grandmother. And, and they and she had, and they had eight children. Okay, so um, could you tell us about your brothers and sisters? Uh, I'm the oldest child mm -hmm. of seven, and I have six sisters. Mm -hmm. and, and I so I was the oldest, and I had six sisters uh, after me. Would uh, you please honor us by uh, letting us know the, your sisters' names in descending order? Who's the next oldest from you, and then Linda? Down. Linda Jones was the, the second. Uh, Joyce Jones the third. Kathleen Jones the. Th Fourth, uh, Carmen Jones the fifth, Jennifer Jones the sixth, and Cynthia Jones the seventh. And I actually named Cynthia. My mother called me from the from the room, the living room, say, well, "What what we gonna name this one?" And I I don't know I don't know where Cynthia came from, but it popped in my head, and I named I named the last child. All right. Well, thank you, my sister. We'll come back and discuss your family again. I think it's time to introduce Mr. Haffler. Mr. Haffler, thank you for coming to the interview. How are you today? Okay, so far. Excellent. Um, can you please um, state your name? If you'd like to spell it, that would be great, and give your date of birth. Mm. You don't have to spell it, but if you'd like to, you can just state your name and date of birth. Herman P. Haffler. Mm -hmm. Date of birth, 10, 10, 40. And who are your mom and dad? Um, my mom, my father was Charlie Haffler. My mother was Thelma Haffler. Mm. And uh, she was from... Daphne, Alabama. Mm -hmm. My father was uh, from Pensacola here. He was raised here also. 
my, my father and my grandfather were all raised here in Pensacola. Mm -hmm. And uh, my grandmother, I mean my mo grandmother raised in Mobile. Mm -hmm. She went to Baldwin County Training School over in Daphne. Mm -hmm. And uh, she uh, migrated to Pensacola because uh, there was no labor or no jobs over there in, in Daphne. It was a very small community right outside of Mobile about, uh, I guess it's about 25, 30, 40 miles outside of Mobile. Mm -hmm. And uh, she came here and uh, worked from different places to places until she met my father at the uh, uh, Singleton's uh, ice cream parlor. Yeah, at an ice cream parlor for the uh, minority. Uh, he had uh, hot dogs and hamburgers, I guess, back then. And he had a pit with an alligator in it, and that was that was his, that was attraction to uh, Singleton's. He had an alligator that people fed, mm -hmm. and uh, it was right around the corner on Jackson, I believe. No, Singleton's on La Rue Street between the Villa and Carl. Yeah. Well, anyway, that's, it's still there. Huh? Yeah. Okay. It's been a while. We share. Um, some family commonalities. My mom and dad met in a sundry, and my mother's name, her name is Margaret, but everybody calls her Thelma in the family, so we have Thelmas in our family. Uh, when you think back on your family, yes, um, and you think past your grandparents, or who would be the oldest relative, or the, the most common relative in your family that goes back further, the furthest that you have memory of, a grandparent or great-grandparent or someone like that? Well. Before what I know, my grandpa, my great grandfather was, was Howard Halfler, and he came from Germany. Mm -hmm. And uh, they the fight in the Civil War. Okay. And he was a mercenary, I think. Mm -hmm. And uh, and he stayed here in, in Pensacola. The Herman Powell Halfler. That was Powell was his father. My grandfather's father was Powell Halfler. And uh, my grandfather was named Herman, and I was named after my grandfather, Herman. Okay. So, relations that go all the way back to Germany, and that was common in the Civil War. I think a lot of people came here and fought um, and then became uh, American citizens, something that the Army has always done. So, thank you for sharing that. We'll come back. And we have Angelique Morris. Oh, you decided, okay. We, we have her here, but. So the reason, um, well, thank you both for coming. You should and state who you are. People won't know unless you tell us. <laughs> Sitting at A. Broughton. Mm -hmm. So thank you both for coming. I wanted to learn a little bit more about what life was like in Pensacola in your younger years, particularly when we had the neighborhoods that's now the interstate. Um, it's, it's now MLK, you know, it's Hollis T. Williams Park. But do you remember ever visiting down that area? when it was From still where? houses. The interstate now is Hollis T. Williams Park. The area under the interstate. Do you remember that area? Yeah. Growing up, yeah. H&O yeah. and all of those places. Yeah, there was a, they had the railroad, had a living quarters. If you worked for the railroad, minorities, they had a, 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 a area for minorities to eat. There was a restaurant called Rupp's, I think. But, uh, was on do on on Railroad Street, and that's where when people came in on the train, they they had, they didn't pack a lunch. They went over to this restaurant and they ate and uh, and everything. And uh, they had a movie theater and a restaurant. There was a movie theater down there. Yes, it was. It was a Ritz Theater, and around the corner there was a theater on Belmont Street called the Belmont. And it was you know, right off of Tarragona, and uh, it uh, the restaurant. They had two another restaurant around the corner on Belmont Street called the Red Nest, mm -hmm. and uh, it was a local uh, feeding place for everybody uh, that lived or worked in that general vicinity for the railroad or for the city or just lived in the neighborhood. Okay. So so um, your your family owned a few properties 
on, on to that. Okay. A few blocks down there. Yes. Can you uh, share what you might remember or might have heard about that? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, my grandfather, as I've mentioned before, and I'm not sure how or why he came to Pensacola, but he went, brought a wife with him, went back and got two other wives from Mariana. I don't know why, but, but he did. And, uh, but my grand grandmother was the last one, and he was somewhat wealthy for his time. Right. Uh, he owned about six city blocks uh, around the Haynes, Maxwell, Jordan Street area, basically where the, the interstate cuts through there right now, that whole area. Mm -hmm. uh, and I remember as a child going with him on the first of the month collecting rent from all the prop. The, he bought these, these blocks of land mm -hmm. and he built one bit one bath two bedroom houses on there and he would i would go around with him uh on the first of the month but he died when i was five but i distinctly remember him going collecting the rent at the first of the month and uh but that and some of the things that uh, mr heffler mentions the area down on uh Wright street mm -hmm. uh where the ritz was and and then he also mentioned singleton ice cream parlor i lived I was born and raised in a house which was directly across the street from Singleton's. And the, I, I would go over there and feed the alligators daily. All, I mean, there was a, an attraction for people from all over the, all over the city to come. African Americans from all over the city would come to Singleton's. And they made their own ice cream. I would, since I lived across the street, I would go back in the back w w while they were making the ice cream and, 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 and all this stuff. And it was just uh, the, the blocks. The, is the area that is called where Belmont and Devilla started out, and it was the commercial hub of the black community at that time. So under from that, yeah, that I, one's recording. Go from, ahead. From what I was told, it was really that part that is now Hollis Williams Park that predates even Belmont the Villiers because you just had people. You had businesses down there, and it was a railroad. Yeah, there was a, a second hub, the blocks, uh, that area. Mm -hmm. But on the on the east side, on the east side of the railroad, and, and, and Palafox and the railroad kind of divided the city between east and west, there was also uh, restaurants uh, uh, and, and nightclubs and, 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 and social gathering on uh, Gonzales, and Gonzales Street, just east, just east of the of the railroad track. So there were two hubs in Pensacola where African Americans thrived socially and business wise. Hmm. Do you remember some of the activities they would do, like besides well, the, the nightclub or the professional? The one down on on that area was called the Two Spot. Yeah. Well, the Two Spot Her, was, was about eight years, seven years older than me, so he. Yeah, the two spot was uh, was late and blooming. Okay. Because the uh, the other restaurants down there on Tarragona was there way before the two spot was, and uh, so but it was and predominantly a black neighborhood, sure. but it was ran by a, a Greek and uh, and everything. But most of my living was in a tan yard. Mm. I, I love tan yard history. Can you, um, what what street were you born on? On Government Street. Oh, on Government Street? Right mm -hmm. across the street from the Catholic Church. My mama had 10 kids, and, and every one of them except one was born at home. They had midwives come. they say, go sit on the porch. Mama gonna have a baby. We sat on the porch, and my brother and I. And after a while, they come out and say, "Oh, you got a sister." <laughs> oh, we sit on the porch. Next year, it'll be a brother. So I'm next to the oldest. My oldest brother is uh, Anthony uh, Williams, and uh, we had a cousin uh, that was had. Childless in Pittsburgh, and she said, "Well, since it's ten of you all, would you would one of your brothers and sister come up to Pittsburgh and see would they like it up here?" My sister was uh, eleven. I think my brother would may have been twelve, 
And uh, so they, we shipped them off to Pittsburgh to stay with my aunt, my great aunt. And that's who she was, my great aunt and uncle. And uh, they grew up in Pittsburgh. And then when he got old enough to join the military, he joined the military. And, and uh, he so did 30 years in the Army and did 20 years in the school system teaching ROTC in Hawaii. Okay. And he moved from Hawaii to Pensacola. He had him a new wife and he came and sp spent uh, several weeks with me and he liked the neighborhood over there and he said, uh, uh, if you find a house, uh, let me know. And he got back to Hawaii and, and found a house. It was Dr. Hicks's old home. And, and, uh, and I told him, I said, is this house for sale? He said, what do you think? I said, it's, it's an old house. They moved it from 12th Avenue to 15th Avenue and put it on Avenue. And he said, well, I'll send you $40,000. I said, don't do that. Don't do that. <laughs> I said, no. You got to get a realtor. I said, don't <laughs> send me $40,000. I said, I don't. I would uh, may mis mismanage that money at the casino. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so anyhow, he moved back to Pensacola, okay. and uh, he uh, he lives here now. My brother, out of a ten, uh, I got uh, my sister, my oldest sister is deceased, Mary Louise, and she was passed away up in Pittsburgh, and uh, she was right behind me, and my. Uh, mm, Brother Francis Joseph, he died and he was born in 50 and he passed away uh, several years ago. And, uh, and the rest of my brothers, uh, another brother in uh, Detroit, they all migrated toward Detroit and one of them passed away up there. And uh, he was the third child of my mother and uh, father. His name was Charlie. He was named after my dad, Charles Hafler, Charlie, or whatever you want to call it. Uh, he, uh, now, I'm, I got one brother that's here, the oldest brother. He's live out in, off of uh, Mobile Highway. Okay. And uh, the rest of them are still up in Detroit. And uh, I got one brother in Savannah, Georgia. And growing up here, I stayed next door to the chief of police. We stayed in a predominantly white neighborhood. Which is where? And uh, which was where? What neighborhood was that? The Tanyard. That was called the Tanyard, but it, we was in in the whitest part of the Tanyard because the where the Creoles were, they they thought they were white anyway, so. Uh, they light, bright, and look white, and they pass for white. I've gotten on the bus a many time with them, and they'd say, sitting in the back of the bus, and they say, you boys come up, come up front where you're supposed to be past the door. I, I said, I know what color, I ain't moving. <laughs> I ain't moving. I know I ain't gonna go. <laughs> I'm gonna stay back here where I belong. Did you, did you go up in St. Joseph's? Yes, I did go to St. Joseph. And, and where were you? What did you say? What church were you? Uh, I was fortunate enough to be born and raised in a church that my grandmother and grandfather started. The, uh, it was on the west side, on, D, on the corner of D and Gaston Street, and they became members of a new congregation in Pensacola in 1908, the, the Ebenezer Seventh-day Adventist Church. Oh, yes, I, I see. And then in 19... That was, it's no longer there, and it's a parking lot for Antioch, which is across the street now. Mm -hmm. But in 1978, we moved to uh, the corner of uh, uh, Jordan and, and 13th Avenue, which is in East, East Hill. Uh, mm -hmm. And so we moved over there. And so we've, we're, this year we're selling our, celebrating our 115th anniversary of the, of the church in Pensacola. Right. Uh, we we were raised my my mother and father my as i was saying my my grandfather uh, henry pittman my mother's father 
was fairly wealthy. He had owned six blocks, and he owned, he lived exactly six miles out of town on Old Palafox. From his gate to Palafox and, and Garden and Garden Street was exactly six miles. And he had a farm of about 40 acres out there, and he raised satsumas and had a pecan orchard and things of that nature. Downtown, he had those blocks that he had developed into housing units, but he also had two stores. Mm -hmm. One of them was on the corner of Maxwell and, and Haines Street, and the other one was on the corner of Alkanese and, uh, and, and Lloyd. So he had two corner stores at different times in the neighborhood, and there's a there's an ad, a ad for his store. It said Pittman. Yes, I've seen that. You've seen right. that picture. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, so he he was, uh, as I said, he had ten children, a son from the wife from the first wife, a daughter from the second wife, and multiple sons and daughters from from the third wife, my grandmother. Yeah, I think I when I was speaking to your sister and. I was learning about the community that was under the interstate. And um, of course my family came, they, they grew up on the Rua. Okay. And you know, Allen Chapel, they've been at Allen Chapel since, right. you know, one of the founding families of it. So it was right next to them. And um, I think what made me curious was that it seemed there was black folks who owned businesses, right? People who were born either before the Civil War, shortly after, living in that neighborhood. And a lot of them were business owners or worked on the railroad or, you know, um, my own people had a, created like a real estate kind of company, real estate and property type thing. But um, it seems that that community from the photos I've seen, that there, it, were, were you, yeah, you were alive when it was still, when the neighborhood was still there. Do you sure. remember what the, what it looked like as far as the houses? Did it, were they all, were they all shotguns? Were they all, were they, was there a mix of Victorians in there? Was it a, was it like a mixed income kind of well, situation? Well, as I said, uh, the house that my father built, and he built a house that's unique to Pensacola. Mm -hmm. He went down to South Florida and brought back blocks that he built the house out of. So there's no other house in Pensacola like the one my father built on the on at 418 North Ruth Street, across the street from Talbot Chapel uh, mm -hmm. Church. Uh, and that house is the last house in the North Hill District. So it's it's under the North Hill District uh, covenants and things of that mm -hmm. nature. Uh, but uh, so I lived off one block from the blocks, or in the neighborhood of the blocks, Singleton, LaRue, Ruth Street, all of those streets uh, were part of the uh, center of commerce and entertainment and everything else on the west side. And as I mentioned, the east side, yeah, you got that on your phone, yeah. Yeah, but so with the Henry Pittman, you know, it was funny, like, feed stuff, I was like, okay. Well, he, <laughs> so, he had everything, okay. um, but he was, he was, he was a, and I, I, I've still yet to find out why my grandfather came to Pensacola, mm -hmm. and I, and 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 so much so that he came with one wife and went back to Marianne and got two more wives and brought them to Pensacola. So I don't know that history, but I plan on trying to find out that history. And his mother, his mother, Grandma Katie, came from Apalachicola, okay, down further in Florida. Yeah, go ahead. If you look here, I started to just out of curiosity trace the properties that he owned. That's an old map. And then right. I matched the deeds, and you can see he, you know, and it, I, it was so many, I just got tired yeah. of <laughs> doing it. So it seemed like it was these three blocks that he owned here? He lit, he from the railroad over to uh, yeah, Haines so, Street, the from the railroad. railroad over to Haines Street, mm -hmm. and from Maxwell down south to, to uh, Haines, I mean, Tarragona, Maxwell, mm -hmm. uh, uh, well, he had um, as north as Railroad Street and Booby. That's right. My first name. Yeah. And then, and I saw so many in the Maxwell between Maxwell. I just stopped. It was clear there was all of it. And but then um, he also was forward thinking that before he died, he gave each one of his children a half a block of land and put houses on it. Mm -hmm. So he was passing on the wealth that he couldn't take with him uh, in that same neighborhood. 
and then as you said, I mean the the uh, interstate came in and took. This, this the property like all this it was just pages and pages of him. These are his properties. Yeah. And like these are the um he gave so Henry gave it to Henry and then Callie. Callie was his second wife. And then I, uh, that's one name I couldn't think about a while ago. He Callie was his second wife and Evelina was the third wife, yeah. And it was um in that East King track is what what they call it now, but then I just Googled some of the property listings and made a map and it was it was just like a lot of them. Henry Pitton and, 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 and here again I, he, he didn't it didn't appear that he made his money in Pensacola mm -hmm. so he had to have some money when he came if he came in here and bought six city blocks to start building on them so mm -hmm. and I don't know what he did what he did when he when he when he, when he came to Pens came to Pensacola from Mariana and you know he, he owned vehicles mm -hmm. and he bought and sold you know things for the store. So I, I'm trying to research the uh, Jackson County, which is Mariana area, to find out more about him and why he was prosperous enough. And he also, his, his brother, Ulysses uh, Pittman, came and he, he was one of the founding members of the, of the Allen Chapel Church. Mm -hmm. the, um, his brother, Ulysses Pittman. Mm -hmm. uh, Ulysses, yeah. Do you have any knowledge of him uh, being in the West Palm Beach area at any point in time? Uh, our relative was in the West Palm Beach area. I was going to say, I know the, the Pittmans. Uh, I know the Pittmans uh, from West Palm Beach. The they Pittmans helped build Tabernacle Missionary Baptist yeah, Church. Yeah, the Pittmans from, from, from West Palm Beach were a part of the Pittman clan. I'm related to them. Okay. <laughs> oh! Alcee <laughs> yeah. uh, uh, Hastings? He I know Alcee very well. He was one of my cousins. From oh, he, would, he, used to, he used to come to my church yeah. when I was a kid. Yeah. So, so yeah, the Pittmans are the Pittmans down there are related. They put the silver balls on top of Tabernacle Commercial Baptist Church, and um, I lived at nine ten Eighth Street. So um, I'm I'm related to those Pittmans. Yeah, that's, that's this is the only the second time this has ever happened. <laughs> <laughs> wow. So I have a question for both of you. Um, both of you families been in Pensacola for a really long time. Yours. Kind of, I'm just gonna say from the east side because at the time that was the east side. Right. Yours, your your people live in the ten yard. Ten yard, but it was almost also like that part of Government Street where it just, the lines kind of blended because you know, now they refer to it as Seville. But well, ten yard was more east west of Palafox. What's on the west Seville of Palafox? and and uh, uh, is is on the other side. It's on the other side, and that was that was. Uh, what they call that before was called before they changed the name down in there. Uh, it's in the brain. Uh, the, the, but the tan yard was on the east side of Palafox. I mean the west side. The uh, east side was another African American community uh, where St. John's Baptist Church is. Yes. Down in Hawkshaw. Huh? Hawkshaw. No, it wasn't that. It was uh, you know what they called it. What they called it down in that area. Uh -huh. um, um, One thing I don't know is that it's Seville quarters, but I mean this. But further east than that, where they had the they had the the, the uh, they had the, uh, the the projects down, and then they moved them out. And yeah. Moved them out to Gonzales, made it Gonzales Court. That's that's. I know I know what you're talking about, but I can't think of what they call it. That was that was called Gonzales Court, wasn't it? Yeah, down there it was called Gonzales. Hawkshaw. Hawkshaw. That's Hawk. what it's called. Hawkshaw. Yeah, that's Hawkshaw. Right. Hawkshaw. Hawkshaw was the east side. And ten yard was the west side, mm -hmm. but both of those were African American communities. Okay. Yeah. okay. But you know, uh, it, it got to a point where we 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 wasn't supposed to be in that area close to the water, so it all got moved out and 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 built up and mm -hmm. and uh, changed. Mm -hmm. So that Saint, what's the name of that church? It's the what, oldest the, Baptist church. The one down there in Hawkshaw is the oldest no. Baptist church. Yeah, St. John's, I think. Uh, St. John's Baptist Church, I think. And, and um, yeah, those communities, like Hawkshaw, mm -hmm. was. Uh, That's what I couldn't make up of Hawkshaw. They were sawmills. They came in with a lot of lumber. Lumber was a primary uh, export. Export that came in yellow pine. Mm -hmm. That's what they they had sawmills down there, and they shipped it to Europe and everywhere. We were in Rome. And uh, we went in one of the cathedrals in Rome, and the and the narrator was saying that some of this lumber that was built this this cathedral came 
from Florida wow. that built these churches and uh, cathedrals uh, in Rome, hmm. however. And uh, lumber was a, a big uh, export sure. because they had a shipyard. Bruce's was a dry dock. Right and they, they they built ships down there, and the uh, ships were wooden vessels that that sail under under uh, sail. But however, it was a depot for the train. The train L and N had one end, and Frisco had the other. Uh, Frisco was over there in the tan yard, and L and N was on the other side. And what they used to do, they would have to go up there and, and be tendered. They put loaded coal aboard the ships. They had a chute that dumped it into the ship, and we stayed on Government Street. When that, all that coal falling in the bottom of the ship, you could hear it all night long. I mean, just falling. And they had guys that had to load it up into so much weight on so much, so much weight on one side, so much weight on and balance the weight. <coughs> Worked down in, uh, in the bottom of the ship over there. And everything over there with Bruce's uh, was a, a dry dock area, and uh, and we used to swim there. Absolutely. And uh, the city, and it was the water was so deep, right? That you step off. I mean, you're immediately in 25 feet of water, and a lot of people panic when they would step off in a in a drop off that deep, and I saved many people down there. From swimming because we used to go there every day, swim every day. My mom said we didn't have no air condition. House be hot. They say get out of here, get. And we would go go swimming, and we'd swim all day long. And don't and he said come ha come home by a certain time. My mom would stand on the back porch, and she'd call me, Bubba. That's what they call me, mm -hmm. Bubba. And I could hear. I said, oh, don't let your mom Can't come here. <laughs> you, you better be in route. If you're not, you got with a switch or a stick all the way home, mm -hmm. you know. And the neighborhood was a neighborhood that everybody knew everybody, even though they were white. I mean, the white boy I was raised next to the chief of police, his grandson was just like a brother to me. It was close. We done everything together, you know, and and I loved him like a brother too. We, he fed us, he fed all of us. Whatever they got, they'd give it to us, mm -hmm. and they fed us. And uh, he could go anywhere I went. He go to the movies with us, to the black movie. And they say, you can't come in here. He said, I'm Creole. <laughs> 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 we go to the Sanger Theater. He sit on the balcony with us and everything. Uh, you know, and go to the beach with us and everything. He go to Johnson Beach. He said, Bubba, you think I can dance with them girls? I said, Bill, you can dance. He got a cut around. <laughs> it was just a neighborhood right. that was a close-knit. I mean, every family in that neighborhood, uh, Joe Patty stayed, yeah. grandmother stayed next door to me. Frankie Patty, I knew every one of his brothers, his aunt, his uncles, every one of them, Italian. Mm -hmm. I knew how to, when they called me an in Italian, I could understand it. Mm -hmm. Because we were raised together, they didn't have nowhere else to go mm -hmm. and everything. They, we had enough children in our yard. We had a swing in the yard, we had Pigeons, we raised pigeons, we raised uh, uh, chickens, and, uh, and we go crabbing every day, catch uh, crabs every day, and sell them before you could get out from the wharf down there. You got, you got any crabs? Yeah, we got a dozen crabs. I want them clean. 50 cent a dozen, unclean. 60 cent a dozen, clean. Oh, you just put them shallow. We sell them. That's where we made our money, and then I shine shoes downtown. 
I had I got the shoe shine box. I still have the shoe shine box. You still have it? I still have. Oh, I would love to see. I just I shine shoes. Shine shine. Nickel or dime. Fifteen cent for the fuzzy kind. I shine. <laughs> I signed Shine Sailor Shoes all up and down Palo Park Street. And, um, and they used to had a, a bunch of guys stayed underneath the interstate, uh, uh, living quarters on it. They were some thugs. <laughs> they take your money and your shoe shine polish. So I had to get run with a, a, a bunch of brothers. Their name were Peter C. And they, are, they stayed a little bit further down on Zaragoza Street. And we all, and they'd come by and say, you ready to go? I will go with these guys. They were a little bit bigger than I was, and they were older than I was, and they, and they were, uh, I think they were Italian too, and everything. So it was, uh, it was a neighborhood that we all knew Look each other. To each other. We knew each other. I mean, I mean, we'd get butt spanked by a son so down the street, and you better not come home and tell your mom that Miss Mary or somebody had to spank you or chastise you or something. You know, you got another one. Wow. That's another one. And, it, and there, was, there was no child abuse. If it was anybody who abused a child, it'd be, i say, my mom. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, raising 10 kids out there, you know, and she said, go get a switch. I mean, she cut you with that switch, <laughs> just like a knife. You know? Wow. And uh, <laughs> so, uh, but we went to uh, Catholic school because it ran across the street. So you went to St. Joseph's. Yeah, I, mean, I went to St. Saint Saint Joseph's. Joseph's Look here, you play, you talking about play hooky? They come get you. Talking about what's wrong with you? Why are you not at school today? You know, and everything. Well, I, I got a cold. I'm just, I got a fever. I got this. You know. You better go to school. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll have school at the house. <laughs> yeah. then, you know. Uh, he was born at home. Mm -hmm. I was born at later. Uh, oh, later Angels. Our Lady of Angels. Hospital. Uh, oh, hospital. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it uh, was a, which was which was where where African Americans were born. Mm -hmm. They weren't born in the in the in the, in the regular hospital. So either no. you were born at home or you were born at Our Lady of Angels. Right. Yeah, be, but see, the Sacred Heart was almost segregated, and they had Scamia General, which was uh, open to the public. They had a, a, a what you call it? They had That's a, the city jail, right? Yeah, over there. They, they had a Tubercula, uh, a center over there was a tuberculosis center that they took uh, Quonset huts and they put together and made a, a, a hospital, call it a hospital for uh, tuberculosis. I remember there was a Quonset hut in the tan yard up until, yeah, up until um, maybe five years ago when they tore it down. It's right across the street from the school. There used to be the school that was um, Hallmark School. Hallmark, yeah. Yeah, I remember. It was a hospital? It was a, it was a Quonset hut, just kind of oh, in the middle of the neighborhood. It's kind of raggedy yeah. by this time. They, and they tore it down and put some those big fancy houses up there. You know what they got up there now. Yeah, well, I know it's up there now, but I'm just, I know it was a, uh, but anyway, uh, that was a, uh, the Quonset hut was out there by the Scamby uh, Jail, wherever the jail okay. was. And, uh, and uh, we used to go out there and somebody got shot or somebody got cut or something like that. They had no petitions. They just had a little curtain up there, and if you go visit someone and somebody's in pain or something, and howling, and uh, no air condition whatsoever. And I worked in the uh, Our Lady of Angel Hospital uh, when I was. Uh, I went to work when I was 12 years old. I went in there, and uh, they gave me a job. Well, that was six dollars a week. I came home. I gave my mama the money. My father was an alcoholic. He could have children, he, he could create children, but he, he couldn't take care of them. Because when he come home, Junior needed a pair of shoes, and my sister needed a dress, or in a play, or in something, involved in something, and everything, so. And I go, one week I had to buy a pair of pants, and next week I bought, I bought a shirt, you know, with the six dollars from J.C. Penney's, right on Powerfolk Street, right? So it was very close, that's where I bought most of my clothes, and, that helped my mother a whole lot. And you pass it down or pass it over or you wore it together, one or the other, and everything. How much was a pair of pants back then? About $3, $3, $4 a pair or something like that. Mm -hmm. I can't remember, because I got $6 and I would still have some change to go to the movie. But I always try to buy something or either give it to my mom to buy groceries and everything. 
and we had like we had chickens in the yard and pigeons and and a little garden and uh, and stuff and uh, that was fifties and my mom decided my father was such a uh, a nun provider, she went to back home to stay with her mother over in Daphne. And they were, uh, they had quite a few acreage in, in Daphne from all the way from Spanish Fort all the way down to Fairhope. They, uh, now that's, that part of the family were really, uh, uh, she had acreage in Daphne. Did, did you, did, what, which neighborhood did you come up in? The neighborhood, the the, the the blocks downtown where where all the commerce and everything was. Which which street? Uh, La Rue, uh, the the villa in La Rue, mm -hmm. and then my in 1956 my father bought the lot across the street, uh, on the corner of uh, La Rue and Roos, mm -hmm. and built a house. And in that year, uh, well. My mother, when I was born, own, ran her own business. She was a beautician. She had her own shop. What, what was that called? Daisy's Beauty Shop. Daisy's Beauty Shop, yeah. okay. And it was in the back of the house that we lived in across from Singleton on, on 418 North Roof, uh, West East, 418 West Roof Street, LaRue Street, across from Singleton Ice Cream Parlor. Wait, so let me get you, what, what was the address again? Huh? What was your address? Uh, 418. West Larua. Okay, and your address was government. Oh, my where I was living. As a, as a child. Uh, one thirty three West Government Street. Okay, because I'm gonna put that in my mind. And that's that's the, between Barcelona and Bayonne. Yeah. So y'all really didn't live that far from. Not really. Far uh, from neighborhoods, but yours was Tan Yard, and yours was the. The blocks, yeah. But the what blocks. did they call it back then? The blocks. The blocks. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. They called. They didn't call it blocks when I was growing up. I think you know. Took, I don't know what they called. I got, I got grown. I got. It, uh, the blocks came into play because it was a. Uh, they had the Savoy room. That was a Savoy, and it was for the black. Entertainment. Entertainers and my grandfather who had a band. He put a band together. Oh, what was the name of the band? I do not remember. All I remember that we had drums on the porch and horns in the hallway, and he went and they had old one of these long limous limousine where they had four doors on it and everything, and he parked it in front of the, the Savoy Club, which was on Davila Street, where the 506 or whatever you want to call it, or yeah, Ames, but, yeah. Yeah. but anyway, somebody threw a cigarette in and said to call on fire. Set the, fire, wow. set the car on fire and everything, so they were without transportation. He was an entrepreneur, and he had the uh, baseball team they called the uh, Beachcombers, and they traveled all over the southeast playing baseball. Baseball was the king. The way out. That was the king of the, uh, the baseball. They had baseball games down on, on uh, Balin. They had a field that we call Bars Acre. Mm -hmm. And we used to go down and play ball every Sunday after church. We leave the church on Government Street and go to Balin, South Balin Street. Balin Street uh, and Zaragoza, and that wouldn't be Zaragoza, it'd be Main Street. Main Street. Mm -hmm. It was on Main Street and we played baseball. Baseball and then sometimes we had softball games too. And uh, the fish houses were down there. We, we, Worked off the E.E. E. Saunders, uh, had a fish house, and Warren had a fish house down there. What do they do at the fish houses? Head shrimp. Head shrimp or ice up. Ice up. The, the, the fish houses had their own ice maker doing, when we was growing up, everybody didn't have an ice box. Yeah. I mean, they didn't mm -hmm. have refrigeration. They had ice box. They didn't have a refrigeration. They had ice box. You had a 25 pound piece of ice in a, in a in ice box, and you chipped off that and made iced tea or something like that, but you didn't chip off it too much because that was preserve your food, the ice. You had an ice man come by every day, I, you know, how much you want? You want 25 pounds? You want f f 20 pounds or whatever, you know, to give them a block of ice and put it in the refrigerator and then refrigerate your foods that you kept. But most of the time you shop daily because you didn't have an ice box. 
or refrigeration. In 1950, y'all didn't have them? They, they, they put, I went to Addis Court, they built Addis Court, uh, uh, Morris Court, and they put, um, for the military, Addis Court was built also because the military guys come to, uh, to Pensacola had nowhere to stay with a family, mm -hmm. so they built Addis Court. And the, they got first choice at living in Addis Court. And, uh, and uh, they had refrigeration in, in those, they put refrigeration in, in those, in, uh, in Mars Court. They didn't have it in, uh, in Addis Court. They had ice, I think they had icebox in them too, I'm not sure. I, I, my grandma stayed in over there for a while, but I, I can't remember if they had uh, refrigeration or icebox. Do you, do you remember the? Uh, I remember that time. And I, uh, you asked about what, why would they have, what, what, what was, what was, what was well, all the fish houses down there? Well, Pensacola was for lumber coming out of Alabama and North and North Florida and going out on the ships, but also Pensacola was a capital, uh, red, uh, snapper. red, red snapper, snapper capital of the world back then. So mm -hmm. they raised it, brought it in out of the Gulf, and all not just red snapper, but shrimp and crabs and everything, and they processed it right downtown. On the water, mm -hmm. so had, as he said, E.E. E. Saunders was a was a place that shipped out seafood, yep. and so the boats left here with either lumber on them or seafood on them, and taking it around the world. Mm -hmm. So Pensacola was known as the red, uh, red snapper capital of the world back then. Absolutely. And so we uh, had that going on, and and you mentioned the people that worked on the railroad. The railroad took stuff out north. The ships took it south and all over the world. And so Pensacola was a thriving metropolis of commerce, lumber coming in and out and different things like that. Yeah, we had a we had a sawmill. Uh, Bayou Chico had a sawmill there that had mahogany. Mm -hmm. They bring mahogany in. Mahogany, they didn't grow around here, they bring it in, but they would cut it up. Yeah, they they would they would it would a piece a mahogany tree would be as big as sometimes big as this room. And they they would walk the guys and get on it and walk on it, you know, and they they had a pole and they push it, keep it all lined up so to get to the mill. And when they got to the mill, they, they had a conveyor belt to kind of get it on there and they'd bring it up, up on the shore and they'd go to the mill and they cut layers out of it, stack it into on the train and ship it to the North Carolina so where, the, where they made furniture. They made some furniture here, but not as much as they was in North Carolina and, South Carolina, wherever they were making it at. Did you have relatives who worked in the lumber industry? Yes, my grandfather worked in the, my grandfather Herman, the one I was named after, he worked in Milton because they had a, a Baghdad, mm -hmm. Baghdad. Mm -hmm. They had a sawmill up in Baghdad and uh, they, uh, they, boat, they floated it down down to Blackwater. Yeah, Blackwater River come back into uh, Pensacola mm -hmm. and they put it on the L N or whatever. See L N N had from from Barcelona east, east. was L N N from Barcelona West Frisco. was Frisco. And Frisco had no depot for you to catch the train. What you had to do, you had to go to Main Street and just stand out there until the train come and come, you get on it. They didn't have a, they didn't have a, 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 a station. A passenger care, passenger, because most of that was freight. Well, they, when you went, if you were going California, you had to get on Frisco. L and N then crossed the line, they had a line right there on Balin Street where L and N had one side, Frisco had the other side. And they, and they pushed their cars back and forth, but anyway, they had a they had a coal uh, depot that they uh, they dump coal into the uh, conveyor belt to load on ships. During the war, gasoline was rationed. You know, everything was rationed: sugar, uh, from from forty on to yes. Uh, to the war was over 47. What, what, you, when were you born? 40. You were born in 40. So yeah. when you were little children? This well, I was born in 47. The war was long over when I was yeah. born. Yeah. But uh, I remember ice boxes. Uh, we had an ice box before we got a refrigerator. Uh, and they just said the ice man would come around 
uh, with a wagon. With a wagon. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm remembering mm-hmm. like, like a, yeah. a, 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 yeah. a, a, a yeah. horse and wagon, wagon would bring yeah. it back and put lock the ice in the, the top. A horse? Of it. You remember a horse? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Horse. They, they, had, they had people uh, with a horse and uh, buggy, buggy coming away with chickens and, and, and rabbits and stuff on it and everything, and, you know, and they have a little bell ringing, you know, you go to the door, you, you say, what do you want? You, I got, I got some, some hens, I got some, I got some uh, chickens, I got some whatever, you know, and uh, they had a horse and bucket. And this was in your lifetime, like in your neighborhood. And, uh, and the streetcar was, uh, uh, my grandfather was the uh, engineer or whatever you want to call him. He would go, Warrington was a community, but it was, Warrington was inside the Navy Yard. The wall, the wall there, Warrington was inside there. And they decided to expand the Navy Yard after the First World War, they wanted to expand the Navy Yard. So they moved all the people out of Warrington into New Warrington. That's how New Warrington got its name, New Warrington, because all the people that lived in Warrington had to move out of there into Warrington. And that's where my grandmother came from, or my grandfather's wife. She was from Warrington, and, uh, and she was uh, Williams uh, she, until she married my grandfather. But they were uh, her brothers were George and uh, uh, George and Uncle Fred, uh, her brothers. But anyway, they stayed in Warrington, and he drove the, the dummy line, which was a horse drawn or mule drawn bus, and they go into Warrington to load, and that's how people came to town. They got on that dummy line, and all they had to do was just tell them to get up, and, and it was a track, and it was like a, like a small train. They'd take them to town until they got city buses. And then once they got city buses and everything, that's how New Warrington came up, came a, 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 a part of Warrington down there, mm-hmm. because there's houses down there where they still got the old wells they had to pump, hand pump, and everything. So, so you two aren't that far apart in age. Um, six years, I think I heard earlier. Seven years. Seven years. What, what month are you born? Forty-seven. What month? No, uh, I mean uh, no, November. Oh. Yeah. November what? Nineteen forty. I'm born forty. November. No, I was born in de- uh, October. Okay, and October I was born in November of 47. Mm-hmm. So he's, he's seven years older than me. Yeah, October, uh, October 10th is my birthday. So let's do a quick, quick, quick rundown in my mind. It'll help me kind of contextualize. So both of you, you were born what month again? October. October 47. October 10th, 1940. So 1940, 1947. Right. You were born in which neighborhood? I'm gonna start. I'm gonna start with you both time than you. Which we neighborhood? Were, he he was born in the ten yard, and I was born in at the on the blocks. I you mean, you were born in that. I was born at home. At home, I, he was born at home, but I was born at Our Lady of Angels home. Hospital. But you didn't stay there but two or three days, and you went home. So. Which is funny because Our Lady of Angels was in the ten yard. So yeah. I had yeah. To, yeah. You know, oh, okay. so, so, but that's, so, that's, so, that's where you you either born at home mm-hmm. or you went there, and well, what happening? The, the, the you know the care that um, expecting mothers got was very little mm-hmm. because once they became, were pregnant, they that was it. They just wait to the delivery time. Now, mm-hmm. now, my mama had ten kids. Out of ten kids, only one was born in the hospital. And the one that was born in the hospital, he was there for several days, and he contracted pneumonia. Now all the rest of them, born at home, they had no problems. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Only thing about it, I, I got, I turned blue because they couldn't. They, I was then had no incubator to put me in, so I, they said I, you know, I, I got cold and everything, and and uh, but uh, however the doctor. You had to go to the corner to get the phone and call, and if you can get the doctor to come to your house. But most of it was midwives. Right. They had midwives. And they, were, they had midwives that come and deliver the children. They tell you, go sit on the porch, and you know, and mama's going to have a baby. Do you remember the names of some of the midwives? I don't, but I, 
I was born in Oscar. Okay. I don't know. Yeah, yeah I, I can't remember. Uh, it was. I, I'm trying to think of one lady that was the midwife. She was a frequent visit at the house. I can't remember. Her he picks my mother <laughs> had so many children. <laughs> yeah. But um, that's that's where most of the children. Not only. Uh, so we didn't go to Sacred Heart, Sacred Heart Hospital. It was there on 12th Avenue as it is. The, the building is still there now, yeah. yeah. But uh, they, we didn't, and they, they did put you in the basement. They put the blacks down in the basement. I went to get a job at Sacred Heart and uh, I put my hand on the door in 55 and I pulled on it and I pushed the door shut and went to work for the YMCA. Mm -hmm. I worked there for 27 years or more. And you said but when you went to the hospital, what, ha what happened? Well, the hospital, I just didn't, I didn't go in. Oh. I didn't go in. I got my hand on the door, mm -hmm. but I didn't go in. I said, I, I don't think I want to work at the hospital. Mm -hmm. And everything, and I go up. You couldn't go there? Mm -hmm. <laughs> no. I, I didn't want to work there, so I went to work for the YMCA, and I worked there for 27 years. And so, so take me back. Um, so you all are both down in, you know, near near the water, down in South Pensacola. When you first started school, where did you first start? When I first started school, where? Across the street. Across the street. It's St. Yeah. Joe. St. Joe. Mm -hmm. I was Catholic. All right. And uh, they weren't gonna let me go to no public school, <laughs> not St. Joe's, because it was. In your first school, sir? Well, there was a kindergarten that. I went to first before I went to first grade, mm -hmm. uh, and that was uh, on A Street, just south of Cervantes, where the kindergarten was located. And I, the name escapes me, but I went to kindergarten, and then the first school I went to was L.A. Curtsy, mm -hmm. which is just a block there now, there's nothing there. L.A. Curtsy was for, from first grade to, to the fourth grade, and then John A. Gibson, no, L.A. Curtsy was first, second, and third, and Gibson was fourth, fifth, and sixth. And then and then it was junior high, uh, Washington, Washington Junior High, and then Washington Senior High. That was the four levels that I went through. For public school, public and, school. and what about on your, for you all? They went from first right on to 12th grade. At St. Joe's. Yeah, That's St. Joe's. Joe's. Mm -hmm. okay. They had the nuns that were there, they, uh, they, they taught first grade and they had a I think they had a pre a kindergarten too but I, I can't remember because I I I don't remember attending the kindergarten a kindergarten I remember just coming going to school and being in first grade there you know because they were they tried to fill us you know they they considered us as a uh, I forget what to call it uh, uh, a school uh, for like a foreign country, you know, <laughs> almost. Um, but by the time you came along, they had the, I, I don't know when they closed the Creole, remember, remember it was the Creole school and the colored school, and then they combined the Creole and colored school, but then it was separate from the white school. You mean the <laughs> Creole school? Well, you talking you about know. the Catholic school? Or what? Yeah, it was yeah. like, back, like back, back in the day. Okay. Kind of like how the hospital was black on one side, white on the other yeah. side, and then even the black side was divided. Well, all the schools I went to was strictly black. Uh -huh. The name, the schools that I named were strictly black. No, and they, they had, I don't know, maybe yeah. cut you off. No problem. Uh, they, uh, they, they had the Creoles were so prominent down in the, in the tan yard area that they decided that they wanted to have their own school. They wanted the Creoles, they, if you were darker than dark, they wanted you to go to the public school, but be lighter than light. They wanted you to go to the Catholic school. Now, however, my aunt went to the Catholic school. My daddy, who was lighter than I was, he went to the public school. Yeah, but I mean, think about it. If you have two children, it's easy for one to come out my color and another one to come out bright, 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 yeah. and have yeah. the same parents. Yeah, so. but I mean, but he, they were. He was lighter than my, my aunt that went to the school. They mm -hmm. just wanted to be segregated mm -hmm. from the black community, basically, the Creole. They even wrote Roosevelt and wanted a flag for the, for the Creoles instead of having an American flag. 
And he said, what you want me to put on the plaque? A mullet? <laughs> uh, now that's stories I got <laughs> from from people, but that's that's part of the the tan yard. They had they were. What's the tan yard? Hmm? What's the tan yard? What is the tan yard? The tan yard was an area what they considered light bright and half white, and most of them were, believe it or not. My my grandfather was a German. He wasn't black. He was Caucasian. Yeah, Caucasian, yeah. European. And everything. So he could go anywhere he wanted to, you know? So his children and offsprings were basically light and bright, too, mm -hmm. you know? I had a brother. He was whiter than white. And, uh, but the only thing about it, when he opened his mouth, you knew he was black. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I talked mostly about my grandfather on my mother's side. Mm -hmm. My grandfather on was, was from Lower Alabama, Connecticut County, and and his my my grandmother Roberta Jones was Roberta Hill, and his her father was a mulatto, and he had slaves. Mm -hmm. And he had lots of property, lots of land. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, up in that Connecticut County, mm -hmm. and and he was he had and because trees was wealth, and they, they cut those trees. And, and this mm -hmm. that Still same on. that same mm -hmm. tree that's been that they were just harvesting and now harvested two hundred years ago. Mm -hmm. So he was a mulatto, but he had slaves. And and uh, I remember there was a, a very dark lady that was in the family, but they, they called her Grandma Babe. So he was, she was one of his faves, and he and he had children by her. So they they were my they were family members, and my my grandmother was very light because her father was a mulatto, and and so and all this was happening in Lower Alabama in Connecticut County. But like I said, my father came here. He only he only finished the seventh grade, I think, and he came here to Pensacola and he worked at at. at at Sacred Heart. He was a cook at Sacred Heart Hospital when he mm -hmm. came down here the first time. Mm -hmm. And then he moved around different other places uh, doing, uh, working. And I mentioned my mother was, had her own business when, she, when I was born. My father quit his day job and started his business when I was five years old, and it was Jones Janitorial Service. He was the only black, only not in the university, he was the only uh, licensed and, and insured janitorial service in Pensacola, Florida. And for years and years and years, he was the only one. And so I grew up in that business. I grew up in, I wasn't going to grow up doing half, that's my mother's side of the family, but I grew up in the, in the janitorial side of the business. And so by the time I was five, I was working in the business. Uh, and I, all my sisters came behind me, they were working in the business. Uh, uh, we going around cleaning bathrooms at night, emptying trash cans, dusting desks. That's, that's what you do to make a family business go. Mm -hmm. But by the time I was 12 years old, we started doing places like uh, the, the, the grocery stores and the, and the major store like Vanity Fair, not Vanity Fair, Fair uh, anyway, one of, the, one of the major shopping centers. Shopping centers. We started work doing that. And then by the time I was a teenager, we were doing all we were doing construction cleanup on all the condos on Pensacola Beach and and down in uh, the uh, the bar and mm -hmm. down in the Gulf Gulf Shores and Jones Janitor Service was all over the southeast because a contractor would come in and build condos on the beach here in Florida. They also built hospitals in Birmingham. So mm -hmm. the Lurleen B Wallace uh, Cancer Center in, in Birmingham, we cleaned it up. How come that we cleaned up that? Mm -hmm. that when the construction was over, you got to clean it up so they can take residence of it. So when the contractor say, uh, Ernie, come up here, we need to get, get these buildings cleaned up. My father would take a, 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 a van and a station wagon full of employees. They go to Birmingham or at every, everywhere but Atlanta. Atlanta was a union. They wouldn't let us work in, in Atlanta. Mm -hmm. But Jacksonville, St. Augustine, all over the southeast, we would go where these contractors had buildings built. And we would take a crew with us. And we got there, we would hire one person to meet, to, 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 to match up with the people we took. So you had a two-man crew working in different areas, and we worked day and night, 24 hours, 48 hours, because they always had to pay uh, late fees for these buildings being behind. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. But it was a very lucrative business, construction cleanup was. Mm -hmm. And uh, when I moved, left Pensacola at age 17 and went to Huntsville, Alabama, I started my own janitor service, janitorial service there to put myself through college. Mm -hmm. Because my father could afford it, but I had six sisters. Mm -hmm. you, got, you got seven children, you know, you, mm -hmm. you do what you can, do mm -hmm. what you can do. But the entrepreneurial, entrepreneurial spirit was in me because my mother had a business, my father had a business, mm -hmm. and I grew up in it, and my grandfather had a business. <laughs> right. Well, didn't your sister go to that black private boarding school? In, in Bass Academy. Mm -hmm. she, I, I had three sisters. My three youngest sisters were the first blacks to, to, uh, to graduate from Bass Academy in Hattiesburg, Mississippi. And then, and then there was the, 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 black, the black private school, too. Um, that was in Pine Forest, Pennsylvania. Pine, Pine Forge. Pine Forge, yeah, yeah. Pine Forge. Yeah, two of my sisters, two, young, two youngest ones went to Pennsylvania at a boarding school for two years, but they came back and, and graduated from Bass in, in Mississippi. Oh, okay. Um, so that, that's what I'm saying. All this was happening when I was going to college, mm -hmm. and there was money going out, and mm -hmm. they were putting, putting, had children in, my sisters was in boarding schools and in private schools, so mm -hmm. I just started a business in Huntsville and put myself through school. I'm going to through interject college. a thought here. It's always tough when you're splitting the story, and you have several people speaking. Yeah. Generally, when we hit 75 minutes, we start to begin to wrap up an interview and start thinking about one or two questions. Um, You've done a terrific job getting it so far. So maybe you could direct one more question to each of these gentlemen, okay. and then we can. But there's so much more here still to flesh out. This has been really exciting to hear um, the history of Pensacola with this deep water port. Hadn't thought about where all that timber in North Florida was going to. to well, hear Pensacola it, is a natural deep water. Yes, port. yes, exactly. So and because of that, it had a lot in the trains and everything. So there's so much here to dig out. Still, we know what happened with I-10. I don't have to a ask how or why it happened, but the implication of what happened is something that still needs to be discussed as right, well, and this right. has been really great. So I'll turn it back to you to ask one more question to each of the gentlemen. Okay. Um, well, well to, to, to your education. So your sisters, lack of a better word, these are black elite schools. That's just what they are. Yeah. And um, even though your family back in Pensacola it, it, it stood on generations before, you know, where, of people who, you know, had, and, and even though they worked hard and maybe didn't have everything, but they worked hard enough to where they could afford, right. afford it. Do you think that your family still either, and here's where it divides, and then I have a separate question for you, but here's where it divides held on to that legacy because they saw it or held on to that legacy even though they they don't see it in the same way those opportunities available to them because we don't have I think Pine Nine Forge four. is probably one of the last black boarders my people came it out is. of Southern Normal yeah so um the, one of it the is still thriving yes Nine yeah and yeah. Southern Normal's gone yeah right so so do, do you think you learn from your folks and pass down to your children the importance of sustaining these institutions. Do you think in what ways does their availability or lack thereof influence your family or maybe the black community? Well, as I said, I don't know a lot of the history of my grandfather, or his education or mm -hmm. anything like that, but the entrepreneurial spirit allowed for the the ability to go and pay to be in a boarding school. Mm -hmm. And so the wherewithal, and I can remember uh, when I was in a junior, in a sophomore in college, I had... Where were you in college? Oakwood, Oakwood College in Huntsville, Alabama, okay. which is also a, a predominant HB, HB black college. Mm -hmm. I went there because it's a denominational school. It's a Seventh-day Adventist University. But I remember telling my roommates, there were three in a room, in, in 1966, I used to tell, I told my three room, my other two roommates that my grand, that my father earned fifty four fifty nine thousand dollars the year before, and they swore I was lying. They, 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 you know, no black man could make that kind of money. But it was the entrepreneur. When you work for yourself, the sky's the limit. You know, I wasn't bragging. I was stating fact. But they were from the north. They were from Michigan and Pennsylvania and all these other places, 
but they were ne it, they, it was unheard of for a black man to make $59,000 in 1966. Mm -hmm. Because four, three years later, I graduated from college, and my first pay moving to Battle Creek, Michigan, was only $10,000 a year. Mm -hmm. And my father made $59,000 and paid taxes on $59,000. Probably made a lot more under the table. <laughs> <laughs> but he, he paid taxes on $59,000 mm -hmm. in 1966. And in 1970, my first job was $10,000 a year working in Michigan, where it's supposed to be the motherland. You know, that's supposed to be the, where you go to make money. Mm -hmm. But uh, anyway, I'm just saying that the entrepreneurial spirit still lives. And it's, it lives in my family uh, because of my grandfather and my, and my father's father and, 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 and my great-grandfather. All that spirit was, is within you. And, mm -hmm. and I've been working for myself in doing what I'm doing now for the last 39 years. So it's, it's just heritage. Mm -hmm. And so your, your, your question was, did they see it? We, we saw it. We lived it. We were not elite. We didn't act like we were elite because when you got seven children, you know, you, you got to be a millionaire. Now yeah. I need to bring you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, and, and it applied the same way there, you know. Mm -hmm. But we, we never, you know, we never missed a meal. We worked hard. We, we, and, and we, got, we had what we had because we worked for it. We worked hard for it. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and working, the work ethic is what's missing today. Mm -hmm. what, what, well, what about the opportunity? Well, now wait. Now we we got to go. Okay. Well, you you were talking. Well, one question. On, 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 on. Yeah. Yeah, there was there was three so, questions. So, there. I, so, you, so um, your your family, Mr. I want to say Mr. Pittman, Earl, or Mr. Yeah. Jones, um, kind of had this business, this entrepreneurial business spirit. Your your folks, you know, seems that it was me knowing a little bit about the tan yard, like this really tight knit community. And people benefited from, they lived off the water, mm -hmm. right? A lot of fishermen, a lot of, mm -hmm. you know, they, they did not have, they did not own their businesses as much, but they were tied to what at the time was the more dominant and accessible industries, whether it be working on the waterfront, working for lumber, lumber you know, working for, but so you had job security. Whereas it seems your family was like, well, if something happens, y'all out, you just out, right? But, and that's part of the risk of the entrepreneurial sure. spirit. But then mm -hmm. you all had the um, consistency of being tied into these big time industries. Would you say that's the case? Or would you say that? Um, we, I had the same kind of business. I, uh, Let me, like, I, I'm, I'm talking about your parents first, then then I'll talk about you. So, mm -hmm. like, what your parents did? Oh, well, my parents did. Uh, I'm going to help you. They worked. <laughs> They worked for the fish, fishing industry. My father was mm -hmm. a delivery person for E.E. E. Saunders and, mm -hmm. and uh, mm -hmm. Warren Fish Company. He delivered and fish and shrimp and stuff all over town and out, and out of town. He did. And my grandfather worked for a, uh, a dealership, uh, I was called Buggy Works, they called it. And uh, he was the uh, uh, guy that takes uh, trucks to get them prepared for sale for people on a beer truck or a coke truck or whatever. He was the man that had to take it to either Chipley or somewhere else to in Alabama. And so yeah. you went into business for yourself? Yeah, I had, uh, I had learned uh, from a, a fella that was in the business and uh, he was doing just like his. He started out as a, uh, we were doing hardwood floors. We were doing gym floors, refinishing gym floors. And so once I learned how to do it, I could do, uh, resurface any gym floor and, uh, and, uh, and everything. So I started a small business and then uh, as it got larger, I ended up with Winn-Dixie's and, uh, and uh, attorney's office, doctors, lawyers, and all that. And then, as they got bigger, I would give them keys to household finance, other different places that, and they work. My two daughters work. I could depend on them. I said, make sure you lock the doors, make sure you keep things. And I could depend on them, and they, right. they did a fine job. You know, they, they were, I don't know if they ever complained about it, but I mean, they, 
they had, by the time they got 16, they were driving a car to school. That's right. <laughs> exactly right. That's exactly right. Yeah. I drove a car to school when I was, when I was in the, in the 11th grade, I was driving my own car to school mm -hmm. because I worked hard mm -hmm. and, and the family could support that, you know, have a car. Yeah. Now, now, can you imagine, I painted my uncle's house and uh, I was 14 years old. I painted, and he said on Bunton 7 and I painted the house, and I beautiful. He gave me a 1937 Chevrolet. I couldn't even drive it. I didn't, I, I had a bicycle. I got off a bicycle and got in the car. And uh, so I had my first bicycle when I was 14 years old. And uh, ran perfect and everything. No license, no insurance either. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we're about to end. I would, I would like to get like a final word, final statement, final, whatever you want to say from each of you. You can start first, Mr. I Lewis. guess I would like to say that uh, Pensacola was unique, even though we went through the the normal that everybody went through as black and as, as African Americans. But Pensacola was unique in the sense that it was a military town. Now, we haven't mentioned much about that. He mentioned about the Navy Yard. Yeah. But the industry here was fishing, uh, seafood, lumber and the military mm -hmm. yeah, and, and, and the military was a lot bigger than either one of those other two things mm -hmm. but the military helped desegregate Pensacola mm -hmm. we had our, mm -hmm. we still have had our sit-ins at Newberry's mm -hmm. and all them mm -hmm. kind of thing but businesses had to make sure they didn't foul or, or put a black person out of there and it was in the military because they got on the list where no military could go in that place so we had it somewhat good mm -hmm. in that sense but it was a it was a so we co-mingled neighborhoods, people, uh, Italians, Greeks. Mm -hmm. Don't forget the Jews. The Jews ran Pensacola. Mm -hmm. They loved, they were the money people in Pensacola. The Absolutely. nobles and the all those the Rosenbaums and all those people. They mm -hmm. were the money people. Pace, and Paces, and all those stuff. Yeah. So that is, we Pensacola is a great place to be from and live in, mm -hmm. because it has been a homogeneous melting pot, where my father worked for all the big money people. He, all, all the bankers in town called him by name, first name. He could go in and get any amount of money he wanted for the business, then no questions asked, no, no applications or things like that. So it was a great place to be and live and come back to after I moved up north and all those other things. Mm -hmm. So it's a, it's a unique heritage. Okay. And each family will have their own uh, story, but it still comes together, but we worked hard and we did what we needed to do to survive. Wonderful, wonderful. And Mr. Halfley, you have final privilege. Well, I tell you, we, uh, we worked hard, like you said, and we worked as a family, right. as a unit. We, we looked out for each other, mm -hmm. and we tried to take care of our brothers and sisters and mother and father, you know. You know, uh, we, 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 we was family-oriented. That's what it was, you know. And and the ones that wasn't, they didn't survive. Hmm. They didn't wow. survive. That says a lot. Thank you for your time, gentlemen. I really appreciate chatting with you. I'm going to follow up. I'm going to ask you to come back. So just get used to it. <laughs> <laughs> all right, thank you. And thank all right. you all. Thank you all very much. Um, all right, well, it's nice meeting you all. Yeah, nice uh, to meet you as well. We give you some insight. A lot. Incredible insight. This is there. Some, there's several dissertations here, and we're going <laughs> to rewrite a little bit of West Florida and North Florida. I'll just say that you should try to continue the communication. Mm -hmm. If take a couple of weeks, then at least talk enough for an hour. You know, and then take a couple of weeks, at least talk for an hour to keep the flow of the conversation going because there's there's much here, and we didn't even get to. A lot of things. So. Did it help being did sitting here together help bounce memories? Like yeah, because like I said, yeah. he's yeah. being seven years older. Yeah. Where I started, where I started, he was. I mean, when I start talking about the, the two spot, he, mm -hmm. he had all that history before that yeah. mm -hmm. because he's seven years old. And seven is seven years along is a lot mm -hmm. of distance like, between siblings mm -hmm. or community parents or something. You were a good one too. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thank you all so much. All right. <laughs>